Hello, good morning and welcome to this week's uh, Learn the Vlorn 110th in the series. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn, I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. Highland Archive Service, as you will know if you've been watching for the last 109 episodes, has four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland, one in Inverness, one in Wick, one in uh, Portree and one in Fort William. A reminder that the series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. Hi everyone, it's always so nice to see all your hellos coming up. I feel like we've got a whole family of people. And it was very nice to meet some of you in, uh, in person at an event at the Archive Centre the other day. I think people were surprised I had legs and don't just stop here. So welcome to the first um, Learn with Lorna of May 2022, the first in our theme of uh, spirituality, faith and belief. Now, before I go in to talk about this week's subject, which is the disruption and the free church, <clears throat> just to let you know a couple of small announcements. The first one is very unimportant, which is that I have a cold. So if I sound very snuffly or I suddenly grab for water, that's why. Um, so I hope that uh, you can hear me clearly. I dread to think what the subtitles will look like on this one. Um, the second announcement, just to let you know, is that I will be taking a short break through June, July and August for Learn with Lorna. We've done over two years of these without missing a week. Um, but as you'll see, if you follow our Facebook pages, you'll see that a lot of things that stopped during COVID have started to come back on stream school visits, uh, the visits to the prison, uh, speaking uh, to, to the BBC, giving talks, things like that have started to come back on next week uh, or the week after next. I have 200 school pupils in. And so I'll be taking a break for the summer months from the end of May and coming back on the 1st of September. I'll advertise that one very soon. So I really hope uh, that you will remember to join me again uh, in September. But we'll be here certainly throughout May 1st. Now, for now, we're talking about the establishment of the Free Church. Yes, Rod, an interesting subject today. Um, the establishment of the Free Church in 1843 was one of the most important and significant moments in Scottish history. A real turning point in the direction of the country and something that has had huge ramifications in terms of the spirituality of the country, but also in terms of the, the geography, in terms of buildings and uh, the landscape. Now, Scotland has, of course, had a long connection with both spirituality in, in terms of both structured or formal religion or uh, a looser definition of faith and spirituality. The Reformation of 1560 led to the rejection of the Pope's authority in Scotland and the establishment of the National Church, the Church of Scotland, uh, sometime later. I'm not going to go into that because I have, uh, in November, I looked back um, when we talked about Sabbath breaking, did a kind of summary of the Reformation and the impact that that had. So if you want a breakdown of that part of history, please do go back and look at episode uh, 86, which focuses on that. But for the purposes of today's talk, the main thing to know is that for centuries, the Church of Scotland had been the national church in Scotland. The Church of Scotland website records this. In 1707, the parliaments of Scotland and England united, and it was not long before policies emerged with unsettling consequences for the 1690 settlement. In 1711, legislation was enacted restoring the right of patronage, which had been abolished in 1690. This returned power to landowners and town councils to nominate ministers to, vacate, to vacant parishes, thereby removing the right of call from congregations. This became the source of much division in the church over the next century and a half. In 1733 and again in 1761, protesting at what they saw as the church's acquiescence in patronage, several ministers seceded. Some of their descendants would eventually form the United Presbyterian Church. Patronage would remain in place until Parliament abolished it in 1874. So, in summary of that description, 
the, the issue was becoming that the 16th century Reformation had come about due to a concern that man was carrying too much sway in God's church so that the Reformation had happened because people could buy indulgences or favour or forgiveness and the rich and the powerful could determine the outcomes of the church. And something similar was now happening in the 18th and 19th centuries, that landowners and town councils were the ones who had the power to propose, select and appoint ministers for congregations. And they could then override the wishes of that congregation. There's nothing there to say that that would necessarily be a wrong or a bad decision. But the point that was contentious was that there was a dangerous overlap between religion and the state and who was in control. Should the state or the church's congregation manage their own affairs and decide who had um, kind of spiritual control over the congregation? Should that be a decision taken by the congregation in response to uh, prayer and thought? Or should that be landowners and others making that decision? It's a very difficult balance when the landowners also had a part to play in funding churches and, of course, uh, sometimes a, a, a role in owning the land. So this rumbled on for, for many years with some ministers leaving, some protesting about the state of affairs. But in 1733 came the first of several splits within the Presbyterian Church, specifically over the issue of lay patronage. Again, this issue of landowners controlling which ministers get which jobs. On this occasion, the Secession Church was formed by a group of ministers in Lowland, Scotland. But it was in the decade before the disruption that things really kind of heated up and ramped up and started to come to a head. I'm seeing some people saying that they're having uh, inter uh, problems with their feed. Sometimes people find if they swap what device they're watching on, that sorts it. But if not, it will be available afterwards and also on YouTube. Um, so when we come into the 1800s, this, this issue is really coming to a head. In 1834, the General Assembly passed a church law which should have helped. The Veto Act, which obliged presbyteries to accept any objections made to a proposed minister by a majority of the male heads of families in a congregation. So in that situation, it could mean that, yes, the landowner and the, the uh, heritors were still proposing the minister, but the congregation had a right to object and veto. And then the presbytery had to accept that. So theoretically, the congregation then had the power to stop the imposition of a candidate. But it wasn't long before that was challenged in court. It actually happened the same year that the law was passed. Um, and the court found that the church had acted basically beyond their authority in passing the Veto Act at all. And so that the church was a state body governed by state law and not church law. And so instead of that law helping, it actually set it back. There were several more clashes around the Veto Act, but eventually, um, it became a more and more split debate and the moderates on one side and the evangelicals on the other side became more and more split on this issue. And in the end, this culminated in 1843 with the disruption. When the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland opened on May the 18th, 1843, the evangelicals read out a protest statement. They said that they didn't believe this was a free assembly. They thought it was impossible to proceed. And they went, marched out of the building and went to another hall. And the first general assembly of what would become the Free Church was held, the Disruption Assembly. Reverend Thomas Chalmers was one of the leaders of the walkout and he became the first moderator of the Free Church. Now, around 470 or around one third of all ministers and congregations left the Church of Scotland to form the Free Church. Um, so you can see when I said at the beginning what a huge, a huge um, moment this was in Scottish history. You know, there's a reason it's called the disruption, that a third of the churches, when of course church population was so much um, so, so much uh, higher, church attendance was so much higher. If you have a look, uh, if you Google David Octavius Hill's 
uh, painting. He's done a famous painting of the signing of the deed of demission, the act of separation, which shows many of these key people, including Hugh Miller, uh, attending uh, and signing the paperwork that removed them from the Church of Scotland. Now, given the huge amount of sway that the church held in everyday life at this time, controlling not only religion, um, but also education, poor relief, morals, a, a wide range of other things, as well as being so closely linked with the landowners, it literally, as I say, was a complete um, disruption to the lives of thousands of people. Those ministers who made the decision to follow their principles and leave the established church gave up their churches, their income, their houses, and took a leap of faith into something that was completely unknown. Um, we have letters that describe this period of, of gatherings outdoors because, of course, the Free Church, from the moment it was uh, established, if you'll excuse the pun of uh, an established Free Church, and from the moment it started, had no buildings. And so many of the Free Church congregations had to worship outside. There are some great stories about this on our website, Ambala. For instance, uh, Plockton Open Air Free Church enclosed by a fence and a, a high stone wall for shelter from the wind. There's some great photos. And I wanted to share a couple of extracts that um, the team at Nucleus Arcathness Archives had put together that shows the impact of the disruption on Caithness. This is from the Ecclesiastical History of Caithness and the Annals of Caithness Parishes by Reverend D. Beaton, published in 1909. And it says, when at last the momentous step was taken of separation from the Church of Scotland, the church in Caithness felt the shock. The greater number of the ministers cast in their lot with their free protesting or free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, as the new church was sometimes called at the beginning, though ultimately it became known as the Free Church of Scotland. Only the ministers at Canisbay, Dunnet and Bower remained in possession of their charges. So only three of the ministers in Caithness stayed with the established church. The ministers at Ray, Thurso, Holkirk, Wick, Latheron, Berrydale, Ulrig, Watton and Keese joined the Free Church. The charges of Pultley Town and Leibster were vacant at the time. The bulk of the people in a number of Caithness parishes followed their ministers into the Free Church, though the established church did not suffer so severely in this respect in Caithness as it did across the Highlands. A staggering blow was dealt to the Church of Scotland in the county. It's really um, striking, I think, to see that the impact just in one place of the way that, that that huge percentage of people leaving the established church and going across to the Free Church. This is another extract from Nucleus Collections. This is from the papers collected by John Mowat in 1916. And it says about the disruption, when the choice was made, there was no great excitement. Only the churches were next to deserted, some altogether. And congregations worshipped in open fields, the summer being unusually fine and open. One thing that created much amusement was the difficulty found in getting witnesses to hear the churches declared vacant. We must not imagine that all was plain sailing. To erect over a dozen churches and manses was no easy task. Then it was not mortal to leave the schools and churches, several of which had been built and got to work by the ex exertions of those driven out. It was not mortal to leave them without a pang. The Reverend George Davidson of Latheron had mainly by his own exertions and a great deal of expense got ordained ministers settled at Berrydale and Bruin and with great success had established several schools, yet the churches were now claimed by the established and the schools were so far lost to the Free Church. So you can see as I'm trying to illustrate the, the fact that this isn't just about church, this is about school, it's about so many aspects of life going into turmoil. It goes on, yet the Free Church was not without its encouragements. We have referred to the fine Sabbaths of 43 and the comfort with which our congregations worshipped in the open air. And when they began to build places of worship, the people in many cases gave their labour in quarrying and carting gratuitously, and call it luck if you will, timber was provided cheaply. A vessel and a large one, heavily laden with foreign timber, st struck in on the eastern coast. A fairly wealthy and willing free churchman bought the car cargo at nominal cost, and thus cheap and good wood was supplied to the churches built that year. 
A yet more encouraging mark of success was the unusual blessing that followed the preaching of the word. The fact of ministers leaving their mants and stipend gave the people a new interest in him who hitherto they had simply regarded as the best off man in the parish. Besides, the parishes before shut to the gospel had set up preaching, and the result was that the message touched men's hearts with a new power. One and another testified that it was during this year that they were born again, as a poor ploughman said to the minister, Sir, the word gripped me in the barn. And I think that's really interesting that the, it was the fact that so many of these, that little extract made about previously the minister's just been the most well-off man in the parish. He's got a good wage, he's got a good house. But then seeing someone being forced out of that comfort and following their conviction and following their faith changed uh, people's perception of what the ministers stood for. And so the Free Church saw a huge revival uh, in kind of convicted following of faith. Another fascinating story from that time is uh, the image that I used for the cover of today's talk, also from our website, Ambala, the Iron Church. This is the description of the Iron Church. The Free Church, when it was formed, was faced with the huge task of providing churches, manses, schools and ministers for all of its congregations. These problems were added to by some local landlords who refused to grant the new church land to build. Many services were held outside. The people of Struntian found themselves in the position of not having land to build a Free Church, and so they raised money and commissioned a floating church for £1,400. The church could accommodate up to 750 people and was moored in Loch Sunart. As I say on Ambala, you can see uh, an image and that accompanying text and uh, memories about the floating church, as well as other open air services with hundreds in attendance. In our Sage Sutherland uh, collection, there are letters by the renowned minister Donald Sage, written shortly after he left the Church of Scotland for the Free Church, in which he describes a preaching tour of uh, the Isle of Skye, where he spoke to 4,000 at Stenshaw and 1,800 at Kilmure. And so you can really see the, the passion and the excitement that came alongside the disruption. Now, we hold certain free church records at Hark, the Highland Archive Centre, and at Loch Aber Archive Centre. And I'll explain shortly what I mean by saying we hold certain records. We hold uh, minute books, registers of baptism, communicants, proclamation registers, uh, and various other things. Because the church of the, the Free Church, sorry, followed largely the same pattern of management as the Church of Scotland in terms of um, admin and so on, they tend to be very similar types of records to the Church of Scotland. The only thing more common in the Free Church are deacon's court records dealing with the finances. Many of the minute books for the Free Church records that we hold, for instance, Cromarty Free Church uh, and Aldern and various others, open with a copy of that protest speech that was made on the 18th of May 1843 at the Church of Scotland General Assembly, that, that point that turned everything. So many of them start with a copy of that speech, a copy of the Act of Separation and the Deed of Demission that was approved at the first Free Church General Assembly on the 26th of May 1843. And so you can see them kind of laying out their stall effectively and saying we are now part of this new church and this is what we believe in and this is why we moved away because we want the right to pick our own ministers and not have that controlled by landlords or the state. Some of the deacon's court minute books are interesting because the records of church uh, finances then often included detail regarding the new church buildings. So as I say, they had to start this huge mass building programme and so many parishes needed churches and so many of these deacon court records talk about the establishment of these new buildings. In the Tain Free Church minutes of the deacon's court, there's reference to the burying of a time capsule in the foundations, including one of each coin of the realm, newspapers, including the Inverness Courier and copies of the Act of Separation and the Deed of Demission. So literally incorporating that standpoint into the very fabric of the future of the church. Now, the minute books 
like the Church of Scotland Minute books, contain a wealth of stories. Very interesting, but perhaps um, not surprising uh, to see the sort of things that are raised. So, for instance, this is an extract from Aldern Free Church Minutes, the 21st of March, 1852. At the Free Church of Aldern, the 21st day of March, 1852 years, which day the Kirk session of the Free Church Congregation of Aldern being, um, being met agreeably to intimation from the pulpit uh, and constituted by prayer. So often they'll start with that. We've, we've met as we agreed to meet and we've constituted the meeting, opened the meeting with prayer. And then it goes on to say, appeared Catherine Mackenzie, daughter of Simon Mackenzie, residing in the village of Aldern, who confessed that she had borne a daughter in fornication to Alexander Coots, gardener at, I've got this, I haven't transcribed this, I've got the original handwriting in front of me, I think it says Kinsteri, um, which had been, uh, which had been, the baby had been taken from her by its father as soon as it was born and carried by him to the parish manse and baptised and had not been returned to her again which is you know it's a very current sort of thing we, we hear about in the news of um retrospectively about women who have had the, uh, an experience like this and had the baby taken away from them but it goes on to say that her object in appearing before the session was to make confession of her sin to do whatsoever might be desired with the view of removing the reproach from which she had brought on the church and to obtain absolution from the scandal with which she was being met, as she could not have peace in her mind while she was cut off from the privileges of the church. Um, so interesting that she's not going for help. She's not going because she hasn't had the child returned to her. She's going because the scandal and the shame this has brought on her is scaring her, that she uh, wants to be back in communication with the church. So they discuss this and they say that there's no visible object that they can they can see in uh, in giving her um, this forgiveness because she seems so genuinely repentant. But you'll see once again that there's no there's no reference of tracking down the father, finding out, um, bringing him before the Kirk session, and that's something we see uh, time and again that uh, that the woman will will have a, a as a ramification perhaps more than than the men. Not always, but you do see it sometimes. So the minutes can give in information about individual parishioners and not just breaches of discipline. Um, the Kirk Hill Free Church records contain extensive lists of people attending church, the communicants. And one of the things that was of great importance in the Free Church was missions. The Free Church established missionaries in Africa, in India, and in many other areas. And this can very clearly be seen in both the minutes and in the financial records, particularly in Kirk Hill Free Church, where many, it, you can see a large amount of money being allocated to the different missions that the church is supporting. The fact that the Free Church carried on um, going strong, in fact, astonishing really, that over those next decades, both the Church of Scotland and the Free Church able to continue strongly, uh, I think, is quite extraordinary. Uh, they, they did both, of course, have changes to undergo. In, in the Free Church, some conservative members, conservative of the small c, uh, some conservative members of the Free Church left in 1892 to form uh, the Free Presbyterian. And then in 1900, the bulk of the Free Churches joined with the United Presbyterian to form the United Free Church. Uh, so we see all these kind of splits and changes and, and moves. But what I find extraordinary is that we ended up in this effectively with these two very powerful, very strong, the established Church of Scotland and the Free Church of Scotland, both strongly in existence. Interesting, I think, when I, I did a project with uh, the High Life Highland Adult Learning Team with uh, ESOL, the, the students who have English as a second or other language. And one of the things one of the people told me had come from, from Eastern Europe to to Inverness and said I was astonished by how many churches there are. There are churches everywhere. I thought this must be the most holy country that I had come to. And I think that's because of our very distinct split in our in our church. You know, we've 
every town had churches, had Church of Scotland and Free Church. And then, of course, all the other denominations, which we'll come on to. As we continue into the 20th century, churches, along with everybody else, of course, were confronted by the horrors of the First World War. And having to deal with that huge loss of life and all the emotions that accompany that and all the questioning, the questioning of God that often accompanies loss of life. Now, the Alvey Free Church Minutes reveal the way that the war came very close indeed to the congregation in that church just uh, outside between Kincraig and Aviemore. At a meeting of the session on the 13th of January 1915, it was recorded that the congregation was 53 and the Sunday school was flourishing. Then the minister, Reverend John Morrison, announced that he had offered himself for military service. The session noted that they hoped he wouldn't be called to the colours, but agreed that the Reverend James MacDonald of Edinburgh should undertake the care of King Craig United Free Church and uh, during their minister's absence. The session, it says, this is a direct quote, the session believed that their minister would do what was right. The session's hope that Reverend Morrison would not be called to the colours did not work out as they had hoped. On the 6th of October 1918, the session met in the vestry of the United Free Church in King Craig, and this is what's recorded in the minutes. The session met to record that with a profound sense of grief and sorrow, they learned that their beloved pastor, Reverend John Morrison, was killed by an enemy shell in Flanders on the 23rd of September 1918. The session would seek divine guidance in their bereavement and put on record their love and affection for their deceased minister. They express also deep sympathy with his family in the United Freemance Bernera and send to his father and mother the following letter of comfort and support. Dear friends, this is the letter they write to his parents, dear friends, in the great sorrow that has fallen upon you in the loss of your dear son, our faithful and beloved minister, who has given his life for his country in Flanders on the 23rd of September, we offer you our deep and sincere sympathy. By the sharpness of our own loss, we think that uh, in a combatant and without, without, excuse me, sorry, I've skipped a line. By the sharpness of our own loss, we think that in some measure, we understand yours. Your son was very dear to us, a right, good, loyal minister of Lord Jesus. Ever kind, affectionate and attentive, where there was suffering, he was always patient. And he was always gentle in his teaching. He laid no burdens on others that he himself would not share. Like many of our own splendid young men, he heard God's voice in this great war and he knew what to do and he did it. He, acted, he elected to go as a combatant and that without laying down or considering or without laying down or casting off God's holy yoke. Which I think is interesting. They say we acknowledge that he went to fight, but we also acknowledge that even though he, fight, he fought and, and probably killed, he never cast off Christ's holy yoke. He died like a brave man at his duty. We are this day proud of him and cherish with affection his name and his ministry and his memory. And we humbly pray that the teaching, example and influence of a too brief ministry may bear much fruit amongst us. We commend our sorrowing friends to the grace of God who can only comfort those who suffers as you do. We remain yours most affectionately. It's a very beautiful letter, I think. And I know certainly in my own family, I've got copies of those extracts from various generations who have had a reference within Kirk Session Minutes uh, and it matters and it will have mattered to that family to know, uh, to, to receive that, I think. There are acknowledges in that, um, in that volume of condolences from the military, so there's a letter from his commanding officer, commem uh, commemorations and condolences from other free churches and from the presbytery as well. And the letter from the presbytery to that free church gives more information about 
uh, Reverend Morrison and how he came to be in Alvey Church. And this is a letter that's copied and written by the presbytery to the church. Dear sirs, the presbytery desires to put on record its deep regret at the great loss sustained by it, by the congregation of King Craig, and by the church in the Highlands through the death on the battle front of Flanders of their beloved, um, their beloved minister, the Reverend John Morrison, minister of King Craig. Ordained to that charge in September 1911, he began his ministry under the happiest auspices. He was highly spoken of by his professors, contemporaries and friends as a man of fine academic record and of promising preaching gifts. He was welcomed by a unanimous people and by his brethren of the presbytery. As the years passed, his ministry increased in earnestness and in spirit. And while he took uh, and while he took on the social conditions of the people and also in the cultivation of the Gallic language amongst the young. In the business of the presbytery, he took his full share and was ever ready to assist his brethren. At his country's call, he readily joined the combatant forces of the Crown in December 1914, first doing excellent recruiting work in Inverness and neighbourhood and later throughout the Highlands, proceeding afterwards to Flanders, he was attached as an officer at the first Cameron Highlanders when in September 1918 he fell deeply mourned by a large circle of his friends, by his co-presbyters, but most of all by his bereaved and beloved congregation who shall long cherish his name and memory. And they say we've decided we want a record of this to be put in the church records. And the reason I'm telling you all that, that one story um, is because I think the church, all churches and all religions, I think, play a, a very key role in a community. And you can see that in these minutes. This is echoing something that would have happened up and down the country. And the differences that separated the Free Church and the Church of Scotland, we can see in these times of global crisis, how they deal very similarly with the crises that they're facing. Now, in 1925, the Church of Scotland Property and Endowment Act was passed. This transferred financial responsibility for parish churches and ministers from the local landowners to a new body, the General Trustees. And this paved the way for what happened in 1929, which was the, the Free, United Free Church, who is the ultimate successor to those who left in the disruption of 1843. The United Free Church rejoined again with the Church of Scotland. And there were still um, absolutely free church that, that carried on out with that, but the, the, the bulk of the United Free Church rejoined with the Church of Scotland. Because that initial issue which had caused the separation, the fact that the landowners, the state, the, the heritors had too much influence in the running of a spiritual um, a, a, the spiritual um, admin and management of the church had been, that was the initial issue that caused the split, and that was resolved by the creation of the general trustees. But at every stage, certain congregations didn't take part in those splits and those reunions, and that's why in Scotland still we have the Church of Scotland, the Free Church of Scotland, Presbyterian churches, as well as, of course, uh, Episcopalians, Baptists, um, Methodists, Catholics, a whole range of other uh, denominations, not to mention other faiths. Um, but that's how many of the Free Church uh, congregations ended up rejoining the Church of Scotland. And we hold documents that relate to that important reunion, including um, a, a programme of the, that, the service that brought the two back together. And as I say, I think this also explains why we have so many church buildings in Scotland. This partial reunion also explains what I said halfway through, which is that we hold extensive Church of Scotland records and certain um, free church records. When churches seceded from the Church of Scotland, they set up their own Kirk session, their own presbyteries, their own uh, general assemblies. And the records that we hold are for those Highland Free Church Kirk sessions which rejoined the Church of Scotland. These records have been transferred to us by the National Records of Scotland under an arrangement called charge and superintendence that they have with the Church of Scotland. 
if you're interested in finding out the records of the church, the free churches uh, that are still free churches, then th that is a separate collection. And I would recommend contacting the free church uh, direct for advice on that. I hope you've enjoyed that. It's I'm aware it's um, well, two things. I'm aware that anything that kind of follows the course of whether it's a religion or a um, politics or something like that can be quite convoluted and quite uh, twisted and there's so many strands that play a part in that. The second thing as I said at the beginning is I do have a very heavy cold so I hope I've made sense uh, today because nothing in my head is making sense today but I hope you have uh, enjoyed that. I hope you can join me next week. I'll be looking at one particular collection which is uh, the collection of the Inverness Methodist Church that we hold uh, at the Highland Archives Centre. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very grateful for that. And as I say, I will advertise uh, September's talk um, in, an, in the next few days so that you can mark it in your diary uh, because I will not be with you for a few months <laughs> uh, through the summer. Uh, thank you, Fiona. I also hope I feel better next week, but I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs>